Good evening and welcome to Rahil Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, July 27th, 2022. This evening's message is brought to us by Brother Paul Walker. Enjoy. Well, it's good to be here tonight and good to be with you and... uh... God certainly is blessing Rye Hill Baptist Church, is he not? Yeah. And uh, we're thankful for that. We really are. Well, let's pray. Lord, we're grateful tonight for the privilege to be in your house and to gather together with your people in your presence. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you would speak through us and that we would say the things and share the things from your word and your truth that we need to hear tonight. For surely, Lord, each of us, whether we're aware of it or not, we have a need. We have a need right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would minister to our needs, give us wisdom and understanding. May we hear your word tonight. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to begin in Verse 13, and if I have used this before, you'll forgive me. However, I can't remember it so surely, and I mean, unless some of you make notations in your Bible, I, that happened to me one, one Sunday morning when I was preaching in a church, and lady came up to me and she said, look in my Bible, that you preached this 10 years ago from here. So uh, there are people that keep records and that uh, keep up with what's going on. Well, I'm going to read the scripture and then share with you what I think God wants me to say tonight. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two (coughs) immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, (coughs) which hope we have, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered in within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I want to talk to you tonight about hope, the anchor of the soul. Job in Job chapter 7, verse 6, says, <clears throat> there is no hope. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, says, Christ is our hope. Now, this particular passage of Scripture, <coughs> excuse me, is obvious uh, to me. Uh, this book, the book of Hebrews, is authored by the Apostle Paul. Uh, He doesn't name himself in it. However, uh, he does make mention in the 13th chapter something that makes us think he is the author. And the Apostle Peter mentions it in his writings in 2 Peter that gives us some verification that he is. And, of course, it's his style. And he addresses some of the very same subjects that he has already addressed, but he goes into more depth and tries to give uh, clarification in some areas. But this, this is a fascinating book 
because uh, if you read the first part of this sixth chapter, there's a very disconcerting discussion about some folks that we thought were saved, but were really not saved. In fact, uh, we wonder about that. Because very plainly and very clearly, this particular passage I'm talking about in the early verses of this chapter say, if it's possible, if you're saved, and if it's possible for you to be lost, you can never be saved again. And some people have taken this particular passage and used it as a proof text <clears throat> to manipulate the idea of God's grace and maybe God's failure to forgive us of some multitude of sins that would interfere with our fellowship with him but not our relationship. But this, this book of Hebrews is a warning about, to Christians about <clears throat> drifting. That's one, of the term, that's one of the words used in this book. Sometimes we drift, don't we? If you don't recognize you're drifting, then maybe you're part of the group that the earlier verses were referring, referencing to that you have come to the point of salvation, but you have not by faith entered into the covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you know about it, but you've never experienced it. And that gives rise in my mind to the thoughts that I have expressed here before that are very disconcerting. Billy Graham used to say that 85% of the church members are not saved. I heard a survey just a couple of weeks ago uh, said that perhaps in their calculations, 58% of church members were not truly born-again believers. I want to tell you, that's discon disconcerting. But you see, if you're drifting, you're made aware of it by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And you don't want to stay there. And then he talks about this terminology of doubting. That's what this book talks about. Doubting the Word of God. Doubting the faith. And it also talks about becoming so dull we hear the truth so much that it doesn't seem to matter anymore. We do not hold to our hearts and in our minds the preciousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth that's portrayed in his word. Well, hope is something we ought to all desire to have. Hope. In, the, in today's world, people are hoping for help. They're hoping for a job. They're hoping for life. They may even be hoping for a wife. Or maybe they're hoping for the lottery. Or maybe, truly, they're hoping for heaven. But anyway... They're just hoping, and they have come to the point that they believe in luck. It's the luck of the draw that really counts. But that's not what the word hope means in the Scripture. In fact, hope in our English dictionary is not correct in biblical terms. The hope that we look at in the Scripture is an absolute certainty. That's what we need to hold on to, that hope of absolute certainty. But God wants us to hold on. He wants us to have full assurance. He wants us to have, the scripture says that we read, full assurance unto the end. The end of what? The end of life. The end of trials. It's eternal life that we're looking forward to. And there is full assurance in Christ. 
Well, this particular passage of Scripture deals with a promise made to Abraham. And you say, well, Abraham lived a long time ago. What connection do I have to Abraham? Well, I want to tell you, we have every, every connection to Abraham. Because the promise of salvation to every one of us, to people of all ages, comes to Abraham. Abraham, the scripture says, believed God. And God gave him a promise and the scripture talks about the oath that God took. And he could not swear by any higher power because he is the highest power. But he declared to himself, if this is not so, if it's not real, then I am not God. He confirmed the, confirmed the oath by his authority as the supreme ruler, creator, and sustainer of this universe it was a promise he made and I, I just want to share this from Galatians chapter 3 and uh, I'm sure these are not up on the deal are they I'm not up to speed on getting all these things you know uh, what do you call it put up there or whatever Galatians chapter 3 verse 6 even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. We have a connection. The promise came from God Almighty to Abraham. And he waited patiently, meaning diligently. And that's what we're called to do. We're to believe the promises and to wait on the promises because God cannot lie. You know, it was 25 years after God gave Abraham the promise of a son before Isaac was born. Well, most of you that are here tonight know what ensued in between that time, don't you? Uh, there was the sin that came to be. And you know, Abraham is a great man of faith, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not putting Abraham down, but I want to tell you, Abraham was a man like you and I. And he had failures in his life. Well, I want to tell you, that gives me hope because I know about my imperfections. I don't care for you to know about my imperfections, but I know about them, and I face them every day. But God was faithful in his promise to Abraham to give him a son, the son of promise. And through his promise and his faithfulness, Abraham believed God, he endured, he persevered, and he obtained the promise. I hope you have faith and patience today because that's what our day and age requires, if not all days and ages. Faith and perseverance. God wants us to hold on because he is in charge and he's coming. The scripture men mentions that this promise to Abraham is immutable. In other words, it's unchanging. I, I love to hear the news reports about how Congress wants to change this and that and they want the courts to rule this way or that way. They want to change the meaning of a word. And of course, obviously, we've had evolution in our vocabulary all through the ages. But let me tell you, God never changes. That's hard for me to comprehend, and all of us, I'm sure, have the same problem. God is never unwavering. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because 
he is unchanging. He has made a promise to redeem his people. And he has confirmed it. And he wants us to believe him. To believe his word. To trust in his word. And the scripture says in these verses that we have fled for refuge. He is our refuge. I can't remember the number, but it seems like to me in the Old Testament times there were 25 cities of refuge. For some reason that number pops into my mind. I'm looking for somebody to shake their head yes or no. (laughs) Okay. Uh, And what happened was if you were guilty, if you killed somebody, or you ran to the city of refuge, and if you were innocent, if if it was self-defense, you got to stay there until the high priest died. Then you could go back home. You were protected. Lives were, lives were saved. And in this passage of Scripture, that refuge that's in Jesus Christ ought to appeal to us because we are all guilty. We don't deserve to be able to run to the city of refuge. Because we're guilty but because of what Christ has done for us we can have refuge in Jesus Christ finally tonight and we're going to get out early uh, hope the verse says hope is the anchor of the soul well most of you know what an anchor is Maybe you have a bass boat, you have an anchor. But I will tell you, when I was a kid, uh, I saw the battleship Texas anchored in uh, either Port Arthur or Galveston Bay. I can't remember. Uh, My dad was on his way down there to preach in Ciudad Acuna, Coahuila, Mexico. On XCRF was a station owned by J. Harold Smith. And Dad was on his way down there to preach at that station, and we got to stop and see the battleship Texas. The point I'm making is, if you'll excuse me, I saw the anchor chains and the anchor on that battleship Texas. I got to board that boat. I'm telling you, it was massive. Of course, the ship was massive. But the anchor served a purpose. It helped the ship in the storm it held it in place it kept it it kept it from running aground the anchor was a necessary part of that ship's structure and outfitting the anchor well the writer of Hebrews uses this terminology for us because we need an anchor Because the winds do blow. Temptation does come our way. Trials do find us. Difficulties abound. But there is an anchor. And that anchor is hope. And that hope is the person of Jesus Christ. Our anchor is is a living anchor. Now, the writer of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, or whomever you desire to attribute it to, uses the terminology sure, steadfast, and strong. That's what our anchor is. Sure, steadfast, and strong. And as you read the Bible, you'll discover that our anchor holds and that our anchor is sure, steadfast, and strong. And that's what we need. I'm telling you, all around us, we see the waves crashing. We see the winds. We wonder what's going to happen next. But we must Confide in the God that made us 
and gives us assurance. That's what hope is. It's assurance. It's knowing for sure that he has everything in hand. We would like to have everything in hand. We would like to think that we're smarter than anybody else or maybe smarter than the devil, but we're not. We must depend on our anchor to hold us in place so that we may have the peace and the serenity to do what God has placed us here to do. The scripture says that Jesus entered the Holy of Holies. Our high priest, he became. And you know what he did for us? Under Aaron's priesthood, nobody but Aaron once a year could go into the Holy of Holies. In other words, go into the very presence of God. It was dangerous, and he could never sit down. He had to stand up the whole time, and he was fearful. In fact, he had some apparatus that in case God killed him while he was in there, they could drag him out without entering. It was a fearful thing. It was an unusual arrangement, but it shows forth to us what our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us. Because you see, now he has opened the way for us. We don't have to stand outside. We can enter because of Jesus. He is our great high priest. And he is seated now at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession for us. <laughs> I don't know how much intercession you need but I need a whole lot but isn't that amazing doesn't that give you hope doesn't that give you confidence that regardless of what comes our way in the turmoil that we're seeing in our nation and in our world that ought to give us confidence not because of who we are are what we've done but because of who he is and what he's done and we have full assurance the scripture says by faith in him you know that most people they come right up to the door of salvation and won't step in have a problem with this terminology faith They just cannot get it. You see, faith is not something that's worked up. Faith is a gift of God. Salvation is by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our God, our Lord, gives us faith. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want your faith to grow? You need to spend time here. I love to hear preachers get on this business about watching too much television and reading too little scripture. But I won't bring that up because I'm guilty, okay? I'd like to pass that over. But I want to tell you, our faith can grow and as our faith grows, we will develop a patience like Abraham developed to wait on the total and complete fulfillment of every promise that God has made. In conclusion, our hearts ought to go out to those who have come so close to turn back. We wonder today where they are. 
And God has given us the opportunity to look after them, to seek them. It's a privilege he's given us. And in so doing, it will help us to build our faith and help us develop patience to full assurance in all of his promises because he has never failed a single promise. Our hope, our anchor, is Jesus Christ, our Lord. God bless you. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.